morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Again, I am Jeremiah, if you guys haven't met me, and um, I'm here with the Youth and Young Adults as my main focus in ministry here, and I'm just really excited to bring this word to you. This is what I really feel like God has laid on my heart for you guys. So if you could turn your attention to the screen, I have a video for you guys. It's basically a gecko, if you guys haven't seen Geico commercials. It's a little tiny lizard. He's about this tall. And he walks into this guy's office, and he's talking about trust. And he says, you know what? You can trust me. Why don't you just fall back? And he starts to fall back, and there's just this little lizard, and he's expected to catch him. So sometimes I feel like trust is really hard. Sometimes we feel like the man in the video where everybody around us might say we're crazy to trust this person. We're crazy to, crazy to trust the lizard that uh, we'll just fall back and we're gonna fall flat on our face and crush this lizard. And um, some people might say that we're the gecko though. And although everybody around us expects us to trust them, we, we just think it's too scary. We think it's impossible. We just can't find the, the right thoughts or the right, um, the right actions to carry that out. And trust is truly exposing yourself. It's becoming vulnerable and showing your weaknesses. And to expose yourself, there's always a measure of risk involved. When you start talking to a significant other, for example, you kind of throw yourself out there. You say, okay, well, you know, uh, I, I like you, or, you know, whatever. I don't know how, how you guys do it. <laughs> I'm kind of out of the loop a little bit, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> So when you, you're involving yourself in this, you put yourself out there. You expose yourself. Maybe you, maybe you say something personal about yourself to get to know that person, to, to show them that you trust them by telling them. And that's, that's what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the trust and the risk that's involved. And there are two words I want to focus on here. The first word is transparent, and this word is able to be seen through, easy to notice or to understand honest and open, or not secretive. One of the key components to trust is being transparent, is showing, showing this person that they can see right through you, that you're not hiding anything, that you're not keeping secrets, that you can just, everything about you is exposed. You're just being 100% yourself. And the second word I want to uh, focus on is vulnerable. And this is capable of or susceptible to being wounded or hurt open to attack or criticism, even temptation, a place open to assault, difficult to defend. And when you're vulnerable, that's your weak side. That's where somebody can hit you the hardest. That's where, okay, this is only one person knows this about me, and this is the most secret thing in my life. You truly trust that person. And if you want to fully trust somebody, you have to live both of these words in every action and every thought process of that relationship. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. When it comes to trusting God, you have two things, repentance and faith. Repentance is your key to get in and faith is your currency. Repentance is asking for forgiveness. It's bridging that gap between you and God. It's saying, God, I don't want this space between me. I want a relationship with you. I want you to close this. And the trust is someone that you have to be close to. So if there's the sin and there's that gap, then you're far away from God and it needs to be closed. And the faith is believing in him. And that's the currency that keeps you going through life. In life, we have to have money to get through. We have to pay our bills. We have to do this. And in our relationship with God, faith is that currency. That's what keeps us going. That, that relationship pushes us forward. So my first point I want to bring up is trust has everything to do with mindset. It's one thing to say that you trust somebody or you trust in the Lord, but it's another thing to apply it to your life. It's completely different. You could, you could use this in any example of life with any, anything in life. If, for example, Solomon, um, he was blessed by God with immense wisdom. And just because he had wisdom didn't mean that he would always succeed or make the right choices. We all fall short of the glory of God, and sometimes it's just a matter of how we respond to that and how God is expecting us to respond to that. And trust is technically giving up control of everything you do. Everything about your life, you just, 
you have to give it up. You have to say, you know what, this is my control, and here it is. So in this picture, take a look at that for a second. If you notice, the guy on the bottom has no cables attached. He is 100% relying on this person. His, his mindset says, this person will not let me fall. He's saying, okay, um, well, I'm going to make sure this person doesn't shake their leg and let me fall. So he, I'm assuming this person trusts the guy on top very well. Is that that's what, fair enough to say? Okay. <laughs> So you might say that I'm bad at trusting or that I can't trust or, you know, you personally that you can't trust. But let me tell you, it's probably that you aren't bad at trusting, but more so that you fear it. You know, something about trust, we can say, oh, well, this, is, this is a fun sermon. We talk about trusting God, trust and obey for there's no other way. You know, it's this happy, this great time. But really, it's kind of a, um, kind of a hard-hitting word if you think about it. If you think about past relationships or past friendships where you feel like, okay, well, I trusted that person and they let me down. Just, it just, I mean, it hurts. I mean, let's just be for real here. And sometimes you don't trust, sometimes you trust and you don't even realize it. So sometimes you're throwing yourself out there and you're saying, I'm going to open myself up to you. But then other times you don't even think about trust in this. For example, you trust the bank with your money. If you put money in the bank, you're saying, I, you know what, I'm going to trust you that you're not going to go spend this, that you're not going to give this away, and the next time I come back, I'm going to be broke. You trust that you'll wake up in the morning when you go to bed. I mean, I'm sure most of you don't go to bed saying, okay, well, that was a good day. Hopefully, I wake up tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> Do you trust your pastors? When Pastor Scott comes up here... <laughs> Do you come up here, and when he brings a word, do you think about it? Do you bring that home? Do you say, you know what? I trust him, but I'm going to check that. You trust the doctors that they won't take you and steal your identity, because they have a lot of your information. You trust your friends with secrets, and you trust that your st car will start and take you where you need to go. Well, some of us. <laughs> So this brings me to my next point. Trust is completely built on relationship. When it comes to struggling with trust or love or anything for that matter, you have to look at your relationship. So if you take a look at this picture, how many of you guys can remember being there as that little boy? I can't. I don't know. <laughs> uh, how many of you guys can remember being, that, being there as that dad? Or is that that parent or that, that uh, guardian, that adult that's trusted? Now, when that child jumps off of the poolside or maybe off of a couch or bed into his father's arms, he believes he's going to catch him. Why? Does he just, okay, well, every little kid trusts every big person in the world? No, it's built on relationship because the father's never let him fall before. He's caught him since day one. He's caught him when he first started walking, when he, set, when he first took his first couple steps and then started to stumble. His father caught him. And his father said, don't worry, I'll catch you every time. So this kid believes in his father. He says, I'm going to trust you. I know you won't let me fall. And when you jump, you know that he's going to catch you. But now that you're older, would you still jump? I know I wouldn't. I'm about a half a foot, maybe a little more taller than my dad. I would, I'd fear for him. <laughs> I'd be afraid that I might hurt him or something. I don't know. <laughs> but as a mature Christian, somebody who's lived saved for a long time, I'm sorry, I've got to fix this real fast. Falling off my face. Really annoying. Let's see how that works. Maybe it won't fall off. Okay. So, as a mature Christian, we have to trust God more than a new Christian. Do you remember that first love? That first love in your life, that first love with God, even how important that felt? 
you're like, I got to tell everybody. I got to get out of my chair. I have to run around. I have to go tell the guy at the market, the guy at the, the farm. I got to go down the street and tell, tell my neighbors. I got to text all my friends, whatever. It's so exciting. You're like, I trust God. But then when you come back to reality, you come back to the world, you say, well, you know what? It really wasn't that exciting. That was a high. That was, a, that was an up and up. But it doesn't have to be. You can trust God just as much as a mature Christian as you can as a new baby Christian. Because I'm telling you, it's possible to live saved as a Christian for 20 years and only be a true Christian for two. I know that sounds really harsh, but that's the truth of the matter. We have to look at our relationship every day because a relationship with trust, a relationship with God, there's no trust if there's no relationship, and if there's no relationship, then it's dead. Trusting in the Lord is not always a five-year plan. It's not always knowing. You can't wake up and say, oh, God, what am I doing today? And he tells you everything, and you're like, all right, sweet. You know, I'm, I'm good today. I'm living another day, and nobody's going to get sick. There's no car accidents, whatever. But let me tell you, you have to trust, and you cannot fear the future. You, have to fear, you can't fear the unknown sometimes, because sometimes God is like, you don't know because you're not ready. You're not ready for this part of your future. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a little bit of an example in my life. I had this grand five-year plan, 10-year plan, whatever. I was going to graduate high school. I was going to go four years uh, uh, seminary school up in Minnesota. And it was going to be this great, awesome experience. And then I was going to graduate. And then from there, and I was going to be youth pastor and then go on to senior pastor. And God's like, uh, no. You're going to graduate early, you're going to go to this school, and you're going to stay local. And you know what? If that would have never happened, I wouldn't be here right now. Personally, in my life, above ministry, I wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to be a detective. And God's like, nope, you're a pastor. <laughs> or you're going to pursue this. Or you're going to be in ministry. And I was like, okay, um, I really don't like standing in front of people and talking, so how's that work? And he's like, don't worry, it'll work. You know, I'm not like a huge people person, believe it or not, but that's what God does in your life when you trust him. He starts to instill certain characters in you that, that equip you for what he's called you to do as long as you trust him and walk with him. It's kind of like holding his hand and him leading you as a blind man. He won't let you fall. Let him be your watchdog. I'm going to go ahead and go to point three here. Trust God first. And you can't get healthy in the natural before you get healthy in the supernatural. You can't trust in the natural before you trust in the supernatural. You can't love in the natural before you love in the supernatural. And I, I mean that in the sense that when we have that relationship with God, if God is true love, if God is truth, then you can trust. And when you get healthy, when you create that relationship in heaven with God, then your world views on these emotions, on these feelings completely change. And you become truly healthy. The Lord is the originator. And when it comes to struggling with these, you have to check to see if you struggle with that with God. Do you struggle to love God? you struggle to believe in him and trust him. And if you do, then you have to go back to point two. You have to build that relationship. You have to say, where can I grow? And if there's room to grow, then I'll tell you there's room to love more. There's room to trust. There's always more room that you can grow closer. He's the water that fills us. And if we continue to get filled, then eventually we'll overflow. And then that brings us back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Proverbs 6 says, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Acknowledgement means that, there, that you have to be there, and you have to respond accordingly. To acknowledge somebody, you have to physically show them that you see them. You know, when somebody walks in the room, and they say, hey, Jeremiah, I'm just like, oh, sorry, I, I, was, I knew you were here, I just was ignoring you. They, they would think I'm ignoring them, they would you know, they'd be like, oh, what's this jerk's problem? 
But when you acknowledge them and you say, okay, I acknowledge you, I'm gonna give you my time, my attention, then you know that they're there and you respond accordingly. And when you acknowledge God, he will lead you and keep you on a straight path. When you give him time, when you say, God, here I am, I'm going to respond to your love, I'm gonna respond to and trust you, I'm gonna respond to you in every way that I can, he's gonna make your path straight. When you acknowledge that he's there in your life. In Proverbs 5, it says, don't lean on your own knowledge, but lean on God. Put him as the first place in your life. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't make room for God, then God will not be there in your crisis. You can't treat God, you can't use him as a backup plan. You can't treat him like a pair of socks. Pair of socks. Here you go, Mo. I felt like, okay, I work with youth and stuff like that. I can like throw some free stuff out over here. <laughs> I can do that, right? A little bit, have a little bit of fun. But we treat God like a pair of socks. How many of you wear socks in here? If you don't, I don't, what kind of shoes are you wearing? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you wear Crocs or something. I don't know, it's pretty cold out there though. But we treat God like a pair of socks. They're the last thing on our mind. Who is thinking about their socks at all since you put them on this morning? What's that? <laughs> no. Who thinks about their socks? Nobody. It's the last thing on your mind. You, you put your shoes on, you forget about them. Maybe you look down, you're like, oh, my sock needs pulled up a little bit. And you, you do that little hop thing. Uh, but you treat them like that pair of socks. The last thing on your mind, when you leave home, you're just, no, nope, well, I got my socks on, I'm good to go. When you go to the beach, when you say, I want to have a fun day, you want to go see this movie, you want to go to this bar or do this or do that, you leave your socks at home when you go to the beach. And then crisis hits, you stub your toe, you need a pair of shoes, but you don't have your socks. What do you do? You need to do laundry and you're out of socks. You need to clean up your life. And you say, I left my socks in the, the hamper. I left them in the basket. I don't have any more. I have to do laundry. And then you're, you're frantic. You're saying, I got to go to work, but I need socks. You're like, oh, well, I need to clean up my life. I need to do this. I need to do that. But God's not there because I treated them like my socks. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with the perseverance, the race marked out for us. Verse two, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And verse three, consider him who endured such an opposition for sinners so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Trust in God. You have to have a full understanding and revelation of who he is. You have to understand who he is in your life, what he did for you on that cross. He didn't just come down and say, okay, that was fun. Now I can go back to heaven. No, he, he went through pain. He endured the worst death that can possibly ever be, that's ever been recorded, that could ever happen to anybody. And he did that because he loves us, because he wants that relationship to create that trust, to create that love. Jesus had you on his mind the entire time he endured the cross because he wanted a relationship with, of trust and love with you. Think about that. To me, that, that's not a sad thing. That's a happy thing. Yeah, it, it's sad in the sense that Jesus died, but he rose again, and that's the important part because he's alive and he can live in you, and when you think about it, it just changes your whole thought process that somebody loved me so much that they endured that for me. Some people would say, well, he, you know, he knew he was going to rise from the dead, so it doesn't really count. I don't know, I've, I've been through some painful times, both physically and mentally, and you remember pain. You remember what stuff feels like. 
So even if he knew he was going to raise from the dead, and, and even if he, he said, okay, yeah, I know this, I know that, and you know, I'm going to raise from the dead, I'm going to be healed, I'm going to be fine, everything's hunky-dory, right? He still had to have remembered that pain. True friends come out of pain sometimes. You ever thought about that? In a moment of weakness and doubt and down, somebody comes up to you and they say, you know what, I'm here for you. I feel this with you. And then they remember that. And they keep you accountable and they lift you up. So, in closing here, I just want to say, trust can be fun. You don't have to make it this boring, scary thing. It can be rewarding. It's good to have friends. Oh, look at that picture. Honey, trust me on this. Sharks don't live in these waters. <laughs> and then there's Bruce behind him. <laughs> But I encourage you to talk to the ones that you love about trust. Pray about it. Talk to your family. Be like, is there anywhere we can work on this better? I just want to close with this. George MacDonald, he says, few delights can equal to the presence of one whom we utterly trust. In other words, it feels good to have someone you can trust, somebody to lay your head back on, somebody to, to hold your hand, to sit down beside you, to let your guard down, to open your heart, to relax and be your true self. It's rewarding. Let God be that person for you. Because I'll tell you what, he won't let you down. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He's always there. Even when you say, okay, well, this happened in my life here, it's okay. God understands. He's going to be there for you. He's there to lift you up. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the the opportunities that we have to trust you and to grow in you every day. Thank you so much for what you've done for us on the cross, how you died and how you rose and how you have that relationship and you're asking for that relationship. Thank you for the knocks on our heart's door. Thank you for the opportunity that we have the ability to open that door to create that relationship. And God, I pray that it wouldn't just be a one-time visit in my life or anybody's life here, but when you knock on the door, that you would come in to stay you would come in to visit. You would come in to live. It wouldn't just be a, a knock on the door, hey, how you doing? It's a knock on the door, hey, I'm here to move in. And that you would just help everybody here, and myself included, with that relationship. That you would just help us to grow and help us to trust you even more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.